Have you ever seen the gospel presented in 3D? Well, hang on, here we go. Hello, and welcome back to Sea Life TV. I'm Daryl Chesser. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, the gospel presented in 3D. Now, before we get going, I do want to remind you of our ministry website, which is Sea Life Ministries. I think it's here, somewhere in this area, this general vicinity. Sealifeministries.org. Uh, now, there we have tons of free resources. I've got like 700 sermons from 40 years from 1975 on here in Charlotte with many guest visitors, but it's like my dad, my mom, my sister, me, uh, all kinds of men and women coming through here to preach as, as well as the locals. And we've been digitizing those to audio. And uh, so there's a, uh, a free resource there right on the media page at sealifeministries.org that you can click on, choose a year, boom, choose a sermon and just press play. Absolutely free, bless you, encourage you, strengthen you. And right there below it is uh, our video archive, which is over 100 and 110 videos, I believe, of teaching in our Sea Life TV format from my mother and my sister and me and a few others. You'll be blessed by it, so be sure and, and, uh, and uh, take a look at that. You'll enjoy it. So, the gospel presented in 3D is the name of this teaching today I'm going to be reading from, uh, reading from that I wrote. And uh, it starts like this. David, the soon-to-be king of Israel at this time, runs away from the then current king, Saul, because the king kind of wanted to kill David. Sort of, kind of, yes, he did. So David does the courageous thing. He runs. So we're going to read First scripture to set this up in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, and this is in the MEV, M-E-V version. Let's read. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down to him there. There gathered to him everyone that was in distress and everyone in debt, and everyone that was discontented. So he became captain over them. Now there were with him about 400 men. And that's 1 Samuel 22, 1 and 2. He became captain over the discontented, those in distress, and those in debt. Now that is quite a congregation. David became cap captain over these men. He's running for his life. He's lost everything he has. His own king is trying to kill him, and he doesn't really know why. And now when people hear that he has run away, they're beginning to gather to him. Those that are in similar circumstances, the down and out, the downtrodden, the discontent, uh, the discontented and those in distress and those in debt have gathered with him. Jesus, in the New Testament, in the epistles, was called the captain of our salvation, the chief, the leader of this new 3D church, the debt-ridden, the distressed, and the discontented. You see what I did there? The 3D, 3D church, the debt, distress, discontent. This was the new church, and it's spoken of in Hebrews. For it's like Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, and I'm reading this in the King James Version. It says, For it became him, it became God, for whom all things are, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons into glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through his sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. 
Paul wrote this in the epistles about who this merry band of brothers, the new church, actually were. Let's read out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose those things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose the things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one, no man can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you and me with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, don't boast in your works. Don't boast in your wealth. Don't boast in your good looks or your achievements or your intellect. intellect. Boast only about the Lord. Amen. That, my friends, is who we were when Jesus Christ died for us all on that cross. His body broken and his blood spilled for our sakes to make us pure and holy before God by faith in the finished and perfect work of our captain. Let me post two more passages. First, we see the opening sermon of Jesus of Nazareth. Like, this is his coming out sermon. This is where he gets up in the synagogue and he reads. This is our first recorded thing. So here we go. This is found in Luke chapter 4. Read along. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. When he had unfolded the script, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Now the eyes of all those who were at that synagogue that day were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Wow! Wow! To heal the brokenhearted, to set the liberty at liberty those who were captive, to open blind eyes, the debt-ridden, the distressed, the discontented, this is his message. This is who he was sent to. He was not saved. He was not sent here to save the godly. He didn't die for the godly. He died for the ungodly. He died for the debt-ridden, for the distressed, for the discontented. Yes, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ is about our deliverance, our salvation, our healing, our prison doors opened, our being released into the year of Jubilee, and our eyes opened to see the glorious liberty of our Heavenly Father's grace and mercy through faith in our captain's death, burial, and resurrection for all of us, for the whole world. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. Now 
is the year of Jubilee. Now, Christ is our Jubilee. Acts tells us about our captain, Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 10, verses 36 through 38 in the MEV, the word which he sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all, the word which you know that was proclaimed throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, this is who our captain is, with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, by sin, by death, for God was with him. Yes, we are a, a motley bunch, but we are his. We are God's motley bunch saved by his grace through faith in the finished work of our captain on that cross. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Now that is the gospel in 3D. Amen. Before we go, I want to give you the opportunity to uh, have communion again. Uh, the One of the reasons I love presenting this communion to you and to, to receive it because it says, our scripture tells us, as often as you do this, you do show forth the Lord's death till he come. This is medicine. There is no restriction as to how often you can take this. In many churches, in many places, it's been relegated to once a year or twice a year. Well, praise God for that, right? That's good. Sounds good. But this is a resource there we can come and remind the world powers, the, the, the principalities and all these defeated principal, uh, powers and principalities and all these defeated spirits that, yes, Jesus Christ did come in the flesh. Yes, Jesus Christ did shed his blood and did uh, his flesh was ripped up and he was put on that cross and he was resurrected. Proclaiming the gospel. Yes, Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Yes, he was born of a virgin. Yes, he is the Lord of all. He is the Christ. Yes, and his broken body by faith. This is the only thing in the gospel. Any other gospel is, is crazy. There is only one gospel, and it is this. Our faith is in the cross of Christ Jesus, his body being broken and split apart and ripped open and just judged for us who didn't deserve it and his blood being spilled all the way from that garden to that cross for us. He didn't deserve it. We certainly did. That's the gospel. So every time we take communion, we are reminded of it. Back in the Old Testament, it was as often as you, you know, once a year, you, the uh, high priest would bring the blood, uh, sin offerings and these others into the most holy of holies, behind the veil, into the very presence of God at the mercy seat and sprinkle the blood of the lamb. Now, this, as Hebrews tells us, every year would be a reminder of you're a sinner because it didn't purge their consciences of sin. It just covered it for a year. And that was merciful. Praise God. Praise God. But we were appointed to something better, a new covenant with better, covenant, uh, better promises with a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ. And it's his blood. It is his precious blood that he presented himself at the heavenly altar that speaks of way better things than the blood of Abel, that de declares greater things, that forgiveness, not vengeance, forgiveness for all mankind has come because of Jesus Christ. So that's why we come and we we uh, lift Christ up again on that cross because that is our victory. The world thinks it to be humiliation. No, that's our victory. Satan was defeated. Death was defeated. Sin was defeated. Jesus' body was ripped apart. He, he was striped for our healing, bruised and uh, for our iniquities, chastised or wounded for our iniquities. And, 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 and uh, uh, our sin was put upon him. He who knew no sin uh, was made to be sin. And he that was rich became poor for our sakes, so that we, through his poverty, might be made rich in all things. 
and he was pierced in those hands and feet, put onto that cross. And everyone that hangs on that cross was cursed, the curse of the law. Jesus took the curse of the law on himself and destroyed it, took it to the grave and left it there. The curse of the cross, is, the curse of the law is gone. And in Christ Jesus, we were forgiven once for all time, forever. Our conscience absolutely purged of sin consciousness, no longer having to bring that as a reminder of sins every year before the mercy seat. But now we bring this blood of the grape, this juice, this wine, we bring this as the reminder of our righteousness every day or as often as we take it. We're, we're, we're lifting this up and saying it is because of his blood that I'm forgiven. It is because of his blood that my conscience is purged forever of sin consciousness. It is not a reminder of sin. It is a reminder of our righteousness that was purchased by Christ Jesus. It is his righteousness in which we stand. That's why I do communion. Not to remember my sins, but to remember my sins were washed away once and for all at the mercy seat of God himself with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Never to be repeated. So today, in the name of Jesus, we come to take this communion. And I pick up this bread, and as Jesus did that night, he broke the bread, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He said to take this and eat it. He says, my flesh is bread indeed. He's not talking about being a carnivore, you know, a cannibal. He's talking about this is the bread that will strengthen your body, that will heal your body, that will uh, bring health and wealth and peace. Everything needed this side of the cross. In other words, while we're in this flesh, Everything that we need to live for life and godliness is provided right here in his flesh. What he took for us. He became poor so that we might be made rich through him. God said, my, uh, he Jesus told us that our heavenly father would supply all our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. This is our wealth. The children of Israel at the day of Passover, when they had this Passover feast, which is the, the first communion where we're headed, it was the blood on the doorpost and it was the roasted lamb, which means it was torn apart. It was shed, shed its blood, the blood put on the doorpost, and then it was torn apart and separated and roasted, judged. That's what the fires went into the fire. It was cooked. It was roasted. And then they took this and they ate it that night. And the next day, the Bible tells us that the children of Israel walked out of that place that they'd been for 200 or more years in, as, as captives, as slaves. And they walked out, not one feeble or weak among them, and wealthy. Now, how do you think that happened? Was it by their doing? Was it because of their diet or their exercise? What do you think it was? That was just a shadow of what this is. This is the Lamb of God. This is his flesh that was ripped apart for the whole world, for you and me. So we take this today cognizant that the stripes for our healing was on his flesh. That he became poor in his flesh so that we might be made rich through his poverty. That he suffered for us in the garden, the pressure so much that almost blood came out his pores. That he was pierced and prodded and poked and beat up disfigured, stripped, and embarrassed and harassed. He did that for us so that we in this body could call on him, the captain of our salvation, and say, as he is today, so am I in this world. Sure, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, Jesus said. I've overcome the world, and now you're in me. So we eat this bread today in faith and thanksgiving. By his stripes we're healed. By his body we live. And we glorify the, the crucified and the righteous judge, the captain of our salvation. Amen. That's good. Take it like medicine. It is medicine. It is food. They ate that manna 40 years in the wilderness. 
but all of them are dead. You didn't give eternal life. It was just food. Jesus said that his bread, his body is the bread that comes down from heaven, is the bread of life. It is the, it's like eating from the tree of life. It is a rejuvenating because this flesh is not leaving this earth. Our new flesh, you know, when our bodies are, the corruption becomes incorruption and the mortality becomes immortality and we get the new bodies. Praise God. I don't need healing. I don't need money. I don't need any of that stuff with my new body. I need healing and supply and peace and protection here. So then Jesus takes the cup uh, after supper with his disciples. Likewise, he holds it up and he says, now this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. That's what Jesus said. Hebrews tells us without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. All through the Old Testament in the Levitical and Deuteronomy and those places it talks about, do not drink the blood of animals or, or humans. There's only one blood that has life, God's life, Zoe life. It's the blood of Christ Jesus. The blood that cleanses us from all unrighteousness, that washes away, obliterates our sin. It doesn't cover it up. It's as if it never existed. Gone, once, for all, for all time. And our conscience is purged. So today we take this blood, this blood of this grave that was stomped and crushed and fermented and boom, exploded out of that grave later because this life could not be held down. This is the life of God. And so we drink this in commemorating and, 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 and saying our victory. This is what has saved us. This is what protects us. This is our life. Lahaim, as the Hebrews say, I believe, which means to life, roughly, and shalom, peace, wholeness, drink. Awesome. Now that's good. So today I bless you in the name of Jesus, and I ask God to bless your house, to bless your family, to bless your children, to bless your business, your job, your bodies, your activities of leisure even. That the word of God and the power of God and the spirit of God comes through you and your neighbor's going to want to know what the heck, what diet are you on and what medicine are you taking? Well, I tell you what I'm taking, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. That's where our faith is. That is the gospel. Our faith is in his body broken, his blood spilled on that cross. So today, debt ridden, distressed, discontent. That's what he came to take care of. So today, believe. Take this body and blood. Believe. Wash yourself with the word of God that Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to destroy debt, discontent, and distress for our sakes. He took all of those on himself. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.